In front of me, a flamboyantly dressed men and women are chatting cheerfully. My name is Jake Williams. I'm a 29-year-old working for a major real estate company in New York. I belong to the sales department. My job primarily involves selling apartments and negotiating building lease agreements with individuals and corporations. Jake, take care of this for me. I will take these documents to the client next week. So could you make them clearer? Contract documents keep piling up at my desk at work, and my email inbox is full of messages asking for favors. Ha, overtime tonight again. At least it looks like I can catch the last train home with this amount of work. From an outsider's perspective, my situation might seem extremely unfair. However, I've resigned myself to accept these circumstances. Wow, what a big success you are. That's about all you're good for, unlike me, a Harvard-educated elite and a real asset to this company. While well, you're just a dead weight. The one who spitefully spoke to me as he piled more documents on my desk was my colleague, Steve Carter. Like me, he is in sales, but he often brags about being a Harvard-educated elite and heir to a fortune. True to his word, he graduated from Harvard. Moreover, he is exceptionally good among the young salespeople. Additionally, his family owns one of the company's major clients, a business almost as big as ours. The stack of documents Steve placed on my desk consisted of paperwork for finalized deals. As he ostentatiously flipped through them, I quietly said, It's fine. If handling paperwork lets others focus on sales, it ultimately contributes to the company's overall revenue. Oh, look at Mr. Nice Guy here. You always make excuses for yourself like that. Poor thing. Just go ahead. I'll handle this. Thanks, man. I appreciate it, dead weight. He said sarcastically as he waved his hand and walked away. I sighed again. I actually don't want to do this. Yet, I'm too meek to change my situation. If I had to describe myself in one word, it would be socially awkward. I was the type who excelled in studies but not in social interactions. I maintained top grades, graduated from a prestigious school, and even attended the same university as Steve. Back then, being respected just for my academic achievements was enough. As long as I maintained my grades, I could hold a certain status, even without friends. However, being able to study well isn't enough in the professional world. I actually wanted to be an architect. I majored in architecture in college and was overjoyed when I landed a job at a major real estate firm, thinking my dream had come true. However, I was assigned to sales, far from architecture or project development. Whether the company never intended to hire me as an architect, or they thought gaining sales experience early in my career was better. I no longer know. Socially awkward, with hardly any friends and unable to make successful sales, my career prospects are bleak. I have a growing suspicion that there's no future for me at this company. Still, I can't bring myself to say I quit, remembering how happy my parents were when I got the job offer from this well-known company. It was Steve who first dumped clerical work on me. He saw me as a rival from the start since we graduated from the same university but different faculties. If we're earning your salary by making deals, the least you can do is handle these tasks, he'd say. Unable to respond, I just accepted the menial tasks he pushed onto me. Seeing Steve dump work on me, other employees started to do the same. That's how my current situation came to be. Initially, I was saddled with nearly everyone's chores in the department, sometimes unable to go home at all. But, I got used to it over time and learned some tricks. I even developed tools to make the work more efficient, and now I rarely miss the last train home. Even when I get home, all I do is check my phone or play video games, but still. It's hundreds of times better than not being able to go home at all. With a deep sigh, I set out to tackle the mountain of paperwork. I'm not sure how much time has passed. As I focused on my work, the world outside the window had turned completely dark. Today, though the volume of work was substantial, the tasks themselves were straightforward, so I'm likely to finish much sooner than I expected. Maybe I'll boot up a video game when I get home for the first time in a while. I really need to start playing some of the games I've been piling up. Though a few people are still scattered around the after-hours sales department office, they all dump their miscellaneous tasks on me. So their chatter is all about where are we going for drinks or family matters. I'm back. And you did everything correctly, right? Yeah. 
Steve's annoying voice fills the office, heavy with awkward tension, as he returns from his sales appointments. Bluntly, I hand over the documents to him. He flips through them, obviously clicking his tongue. Hoping to find a mistake to exaggerate and torment me over, but failing to find any, he's visibly frustrated. I really wish I could talk back, but challenging Steve with my poor communication skills would only backfire. Silently enduring is my only option. By the way, you're always free, right? There's a mixer tonight with graduates from a prestigious women's college. But one of the guys had to cancel because he's sick. It would look bad for me if we're short on men. You might as well come along. Ah, no. I'm okay with drinking parties, but that kind isn't really my thing. I'm not interested. You don't have the right to refuse. Hurry up and get ready. With that, Steve grabs my arm, forcibly pulling me to my feet. Followed to the locker room as if under surveillance, I give up any thought of escaping. I'm disgusted with myself for not just refusing and fleeing, truly, I am hopeless. With a heavy sigh in my heart, I quietly follow Steve. He brings us to a trendy bistro located on top of the high-rise building near the station. The place is popular for its good atmosphere and casual vibe, which doesn't require dressing up too much, even someone like me who usually only visits fast food or pizza franchise restaurants, has heard good things about it. According to the waiter, the rest of the group has already arrived. At a table with a view of the night skyline, three women and one man who somewhat resembles Steve are engaging in light chatter as they wait. The man is probably an acquaintance of Steve's. Though their exact relationship is unclear. He seems very outgoing, easily chatting up the women. The three women, all different from our faculties, appear to be Harvard graduates. Two of them have dyed blonde, long, curly hair and are decked out head to toe in famous brands, giving off the vibe of trendy, fashionable women. I learn they work in advertising and as a flight attendant. However, the woman sitting closest to me, pushed to the edge of the table, catches my eye. Her bag is branded, but unlike the other two, it's not from famous one. She's overweight, and her skin is so troubled that no amount of foundation or concealer could hide it. Steve glances at her disdainfully and then turns to speak to the woman sitting in the center. Did you also make up the numbers? Exactly. We had another girl lined up, but she got a boyfriend, so we brought Madison, who's never been to a mixer. Thought it might cheer her up a bit. We're so kind, aren't we? Right? The flashy women giggle together, their conversation seeming to mock Madison. It's unpleasant even just to watch. When I sit down, Madison and I make eye contact, and she tentatively starts talking to me. Um, I'm Madison. Nice to meet you. I'm Jake. I work for ABC Real Estate. Ah, uh, um, this building is also managed by your company, right? Ah, uh, yes, you're well informed. Yes. Sorry, um, I like architecture. The concept of this building, it's about harmony between water, people, and nature, right? Yes, it was supervised by a well-known designer. Oh, really? Actually, I'm a big fan of that designer and was eagerly waiting for this building to be completed. The first time I saw the beautifully arranged trees and the waterfall-like fountain at the entrance, I was moved, Madison shared. Yeah, the atrium also adds a lot of impact. It's got this strange charm, being so natural yet artificially crafted. I've been a fan of that designer too, so I was excited from the planning stages. I really put my heart into it when I got involved in the sales of this building, I replied. This building was one of the rare projects where I was able to be proactive. Feeling inspired right from the planning stage, I naturally poured passion into the sales activities. Usually struggling at the bottom, my performance during that period surprised everyone as I climbed to the top ranks. Initially, our conversation was awkward, but as we delved into topics we were passionate about, we found ourselves smoothly engaged in conversation. After enjoying a pleasant talk for a while, I made up my mind to suggest something to Madison and started to speak. Um, excuse me. Um. She started at almost the same time. Our voices overlapped creating a moment of awkwardness tinged with embarrassment. Oh, sorry, please, Jake, you go ahead, Madison insisted. No, please, Madison, you first, I responded. We both ended up saying nearly the same thing at almost the same time again. 
It made us laugh, our timing sinking even in our amusement. I'll go first then. If it's okay with you, could we exchange phone numbers? She asked. Of course. Are you sure? I eagerly replied. Yes. I'd really like to have a detailed discussion about architecture with you, Jake, and maybe even visit museums and architectural sites. I usually go to these places with my dad, but I've been wanting to go with someone my own age, she explained. I'd love that. How about we go to a museum next time? There's a limited time exhibition on contemporary architecture happening right now. I suggested. Oh. I've been wanting to go there too. Definitely. Madison agreed. We both pulled out our phones and opened our messaging apps to add each other as contacts. We tried to scan the QR codes, but... Uh, wasn't it possible to get to the screen from here? I wondered aloud. I thought so too. Madison seemed puzzled. Both of us struggled with the app. I usually only used for straightforward responses to messages from my mother like, are you eating well, or are you coming home for Christmas? It had been years since I had added a new contact. Madison seemed to be in the same boat. Only regularly communicating with a set group of family and friends, having forgotten how to add new contacts. Glancing sideways, I considered asking Steve and the others for help, but they seemed to have forgotten our presence. Deeply engrossed in their own cheerful conversation. It didn't seem right to interrupt them, and there was a risk of receiving some snide remark. Though I'm used to Steve's sarcasm, I didn't want Madison to feel uncomfortable, so we kept trying to figure it out together instead. Eventually, unable to find the right screen. We searched online and discovered that the feature had been moved to a completely different part of the app due to an update. It's hard to notice when they change it this much, I said. You'd easily miss it, right? We laughed together as we finally managed to add each other. Madison's profile icon was a monster character from a children's cartoon popular when I was young. Even the sticker she sent as a test message featured the same character. Feeling nostalgic, I decided to bring it up. Is that a cartoon character, right? I asked. Do you know it, Jake? Yes, it is. I've loved it since I was a kid and still collect the merchandise, she responded. I liked it too. Even now as an adult, if I see some toys, I can't help buying it. I live alone away from home now. But I have a collection of that merchandise displayed on my TV stand, I shared. They're really cute. Oh, by the way, what were you going to say earlier, she inquired. Oh, that thing I started to say earlier? I clarified. Yes. Well, uh... I was going to ask if we could exchange contact information too, so I guess my point is already covered. It's surprising we were about to say the same thing at the same time, I said, a bit embarrassed. Was that so? Yes. Embarrassed, I smiled shyly back. This was, after all, a mixer. While it's true that mixers are places to look for potential partners, I had forgotten all about that because I genuinely enjoy talking to Madison. It's funny how, when you deliberately take steps or make a conscious effort in relationships, it can make you feel unexpectedly shy. My relationship with Madison progressed smoothly after that. It felt like we hadn't just met, our tastes and interests were remarkably similar. We both preferred quiet, subdued places over noisy, flashy ones. Both of us loved architecture, and our tastes in cartoon characters and music were almost identical. Which made it easy to recommend things we liked without any hesitation. Whether or not we saw each other as potential romantic partners was another matter, but at least the time I spent with Madison was very comfortable. And there was an unexpected benefit. Talking openly with Madison gradually eased my fear and apprehension towards others, and before I knew it, we had developed a good relationship. Since moving to New York for university and leaving my family behind, I realized I rarely made eye contact or talked with others. I didn't talk much with professors or fellow students about anything other than studies, and at work. I hardly ever engaged in non-work-related conversations. In fact, even work conversations were kept to a bare minimum. Perhaps it was my naturally shy and introverted personality, but more than that, I had simply forgotten how to converse because I avoided it so much. Strangely, as I started to feel a bit more positive, the motivation to change my situation began to grow. All right. I'm going to change jobs. What? 
Where did that come from? Madison blinked in surprise. I suddenly muttered to myself during a coffee date with Madison. It's understandable she would be shocked by such a sudden declaration. Taking a deep breath, I explained to a confused Madison why I felt this way. How I'd always wanted to be an architect since I was a child, how I thought I'd landed a dream job in the industry only to be placed in sales. How I wasn't good at dealing with people and had ended up failing in sales. There was a bit of embarrassment. I was afraid of disappointing her. But somehow, I felt that Madison would understand. True to my feelings, Madison listened quietly as I spoke. After I had finished, she clapped her hands lightly and said with a smile. I know of a small but reputable architectural firm. If you like, I can introduce you to them. I had no reason to decline Madison's offer. Later, I sent my resume to the architectural firm she recommended, and everything progressed smoothly to the interview stage. On the day of the interview. It was a one-on-one -on -one with the director. Nervously, I knocked on the door. A gentle male voice invited me in. It's been a while, Jake. Uh, what? I was initially confused by the kind voice, but I quickly recognized him. It was the warm gaze and the mole under his eye that looked like a tear, which seemed to express trouble. I remembered him by his trademark tortoiseshell glasses. Daniel. Yes, that's right. I'm Daniel Foster, Madison's father and the director of Foster Architectural Office. I suddenly remembered. This man was the local architect who had inspired me to pursue this career. My father was frequently transferred for work. Sometimes we moved every six months, sometimes we stayed as long as two years, but it was always to different places. Making friends only to soon say goodbye, and often being mistreated by other kids because I was always the new kid. I became quite phobic of interactions with others. The only family outside of my parents with whom I could ever open up was the architect's family. The kind architect Daniel and his wife. And their daughter, the girl my age I used to call by Maddie. I was particularly close Maddie. We used to mimic Daniel with the cartoon characters colored pencils and draw our ideal houses together. At the time, I was too young to realize it, but looking back, I think that might have been my first crush. Even after my father's job determined we had to move, I continued to correspond with Maddie. I wondered what words would make Maddie happy. Thinking it over, if I found the cartoon character's stationery or stickers, I would beg my mother to buy them for me to use in my letters to Maddie. However, after I moved again, and Maddie's family also moved, we eventually lost touch without realizing it. So, Maddie was actually Madison, huh? Yes. I recognized you from the photos Madison showed me instantly, but she hadn't noticed. It's funny, she didn't realize it at first. But you two started dating because you got along so well, I guess. Then, before I knew it, ten years had passed. During that time, my name changed to Jake Foster. Yes, I married Madison and became an adopted son-in-law to take over the office. Originally holding an architect's license, I gained practical experience under Daniel's guidance and became a first-class architect. Before I knew it, I had become somewhat of a celebrity within the industry while being passionately involved in my work. I was living fulfilling days, doing what I loved as a job. Then, a former associate from the architectural firm I had belonged to contacted me. They wanted me to design and construct a large commercial building as part of the redevelopment of an area around a certain station. Today, the person in charge was supposed to come over to discuss the details and decide whether to formally accept the job, but... Ha! Huh. Jake? Long time no see, Steve. Ah, I see you're now the assistant manager. I was slightly taken aback by the appearance of the person in charge. The person in front of me was unexpectedly Steve. Steve seemed just as surprised to see me. However, professionally, Steve handed me his business card, which stated his position as assistant manager. I had thought with his track record he might have been at least a vice manager by now, so this was a bit surprising. My murmuring seemed to have hit a nerve with Steve. He frowned unpleasantly, his forehead, whiter than before, wrinkling up. You're just right for a small architecture office clerk like this, aren't you? Come on, hurry up and call Jake. I don't have time to deal with a loser like you. It's me, though. What? You've got an appointment with architect Jake Foster, right? I'm Jake Foster. What? 
You were Williams, weren't you? I took my wife's surname when we got married. I'm now a foster. What? There's no woman who chooses a loser like you. I did choose him. I'm the one who chose him. Steve's face froze in shock as a beautiful woman suddenly joined the conversation. Her long, straight black hair. Elegant attire. Makeup that wasn't flashy but enhanced the quality of her features. Even without familial bias, she was indeed very beautiful. Madison, have you finished putting the kids to bed? Yes, they went to sleep easily today. I had just put them to bed and was about to take a break when I heard some disturbing conversation and came to see what was happening. Sorry for being noisy. It's okay, you can go rest in the back, Madison. No, I have something to say. Madison looked at Steve with a sharp gaze, as if pinning him down. Caught off guard, Steve flinched under her stare. It's been a long time, Steve. Um, have we met before? Don't you remember? I suppose not. You didn't seem to notice me at all. Steve appeared confused by Madison's words. With a sigh, Madison continued. There was a mixer you forcefully brought Jake to. I was there too. What? Why? I've heard about it. You got dumped harshly by both of them afterward, didn't you? You've heard about it? Yes, those two were my best friends during my college years. You mean, you were that plain, overweight girl back then? Steve asked with a tremor in his voice, to which Madison agreed. Steve, in disbelief, examined Madison from head to toe, as if trying to reconcile her current appearance with his memory. No, you're like a completely different person. No, it's really me. No mistake, Madison confirmed. But, the girl who was there at the time was really awful. Her hair was a mess, her skin was terrible, and her figure. She looked like she was just there to make the other two stand out, didn't she? Yes, that's right. At that time, I had become depressed following my mother's sudden death in a car accident. My skin flared up. And I gained weight. But fortunately, it meant I avoided the attention of someone like you. Plus, I got to reunite with my first love and even got married. What? Steve seemed wounded by Madison's words. He glared aggressively, but Madison did not flinch. Instead, Steve seemed intimidated by Madison's composure. After my mother died, I was really down. And my two friends thought that maybe a new encounter could cheer me up, so they invited me to that mixer. At that mixer. I coincidentally reunited with Jake, my childhood friend, and well, it turned out to be really good. But you, you openly mocked us, right? They were so disgusted by your shallowness that they dumped you, Madison recounted. At the mixer, the two flamboyant women with Madison had been her best friends from her student days. I felt bad at the time, thinking maybe they were mocking her by making her the butt of the joke. But in reality, they were trying to cheer her up after her mother's sudden death by pretending to be upbeat. They thought acting nonchalantly might make Madison feel more pressured. So they behaved that way under the guise of filling numbers, which unfortunately came across as disrespectful to Madison. Interestingly, the four excluding us were conversing separately at that time to avoid disturbing Madison and me as our conversation was getting lively. Of course, there was no malice in their actions, it was entirely misdirected consideration. As my relationship with Madison progressed and I was introduced to them, I learned of the misunderstanding and apologized for my previous misconceptions. They also realized how it might have looked from the outside and apologized, saying, it did look like we were mocking Madison, didn't it? After a series of apologies, we all ended up laughing about the misunderstanding. Madison had always spoken of them as her proud friends, and they truly were. Getting to know them, they turned out to be wonderful women, beautiful both inside and out. As we became closer, we discussed all sorts of things, including how we came to date. I simply explained that it was because we enjoyed talking and shared similar hobbies and personalities. But I also mentioned how I had discovered that the girl I used to draw the ideal house with the cartoon character's colored pencils was actually Madison. We all laughed again at the chance reunion at a mixer we were both reluctant to attend. Since then, we have maintained a great relationship, family style, and despite their busy schedules, they often visit our home and dote on our children. One of them is getting married soon, 
and my child, who affectionately calls her big sister, is excited to be the ring bearer at the wedding. The other one had been secretly dating a friend of Steve's from the mixer, and Madison often receives gushing messages about their relationship. Interestingly, despite his frivolous demeanor, this man turned out to be a considerate and kind person, unlike Steve. In other words, Steve was the only true clown at that mixer. And still unaware of it, he continues to look down on others, beyond redemption. Well, even if we hadn't spoken up back then, they might have seen through you eventually. Those two have a terrifyingly good judgment of character. I mentioned. That's true. They are my proud friends, after all. So, what is this? Both of you teaming up for revenge? No, not at all. I just had something I wanted to say because you were still trying to belittle Jake. Madison stated boldly. Steve, unable to respond and looking frustrated, watched Madison. I decided it was time to move on to the main topic and prompt him to leave. Let's leave the past behind. Regarding the current job, I think we'll have to decline, so could you please leave? What? Is this some grudge against me? It's not a personal vendetta or anything childish like that. It's just that I don't think we can do our best work with you in charge, I explained. See, it is a personal grudge. It's not. I know how you work from having to do your paperwork. You always try to cut costs and make changes to specifications to save money. And you push these through quite forcefully using the company's name. Indeed, as a salesperson, maybe that's correct. But I don't think I can do my best work with that approach, so I'd prefer if you left. We'd both just be wasting our time otherwise. Realizing further argument was pointless, Steve quietly left. Ultimately, the commercial building development project he had intended to lead was handed over to a junior colleague of his. This colleague then approached my office with much better terms and a genuine passion for the work. It turns out this younger colleague was a fellow architecture enthusiast like Madison and me. He presented the project with such enthusiasm that exceeded the scope of typical business. Expressing admiration for my past work and insisting that this project needed my expertise. I liked his attitude and accepted the job. Conversations with him and the project team were always exhilarating, and before we knew it, we had created a piece of architectural romance. They went to great lengths to ensure my plans were approved and secured the necessary budget. Thus, we spent busy yet fulfilling days, and the project concluded with great success. Due to this project, the younger colleague was promoted, while Steve, edged out in the form his junior colleague took over, found himself in an awkward position within the company. When I was at that company, Steve had been celebrated as a star of the sales department, but as times changed, his methods became less acceptable to clients. His sales performance is now average at best. He had been overtaken in both sales and promotions by his junior colleagues, and I heard he remains single despite some relationships, struggling to make the commitment to marriage. His once admired title of young ace of the sales department at a major company helped him in his younger days, but as he aged, his unappealing personality and declining looks gradually made him less attractive. Though the marriage market might still hold some potential for him, his high pride seems to prevent him from engaging in serious efforts to find a partner. His family's large enterprise officially chose his older brother as the successor. Originally, his father had intended to pass the mantle to his elder son, but Steve had tried to prove himself worthy by excelling at the company. However, as earlier mentioned, it ended with his brother taking over, leaving Steve without a place both in his company and family home, unable to create a haven called home for himself. While I do feel a bit sorry for him, well, he's now just someone I used to know. Comparing oneself with others. Belittling others. Taking the high ground are perhaps primal instincts of social animals, but acting solely on instinct is no different from a beast. Respecting others and being kind. While these may seem basic, people like Steve who cannot do so are certainly out there. Hopefully, they will eventually realize this on their own.